And once I was introduced to that concept, I realized that, you know, I was on a safe path. I would make great money. I could retire a millionaire and by all accounts be successful. But if I was that 80 year old looking back, I would not have been happy or fulfilled because I felt like I was living a lie. I wasn't living up to whatever kind of potential that I felt like I could reach. and welcome to Opportunity Made. I am the host of the show, Katherine Lewis, and today I have an amazing guest, James Hudnall. Welcome to the show, James. Thank you, Catherine. I'm so excited to be here, usually on the other side of the mic, I guess. And so, yeah, super excited to uh, have this conversation with you. Yeah, I'm really excited to switch roles. It was so fun coming on your show, and now I'm excited to have you on mine. Um, we're just going to dive straight in because James, you have such an interesting history. And while I could do an introduction, I would just love to hear it directly from you. So let's start out, um, about the time you were in college or maybe pre-college and just to give everyone a little foreshadowing, um, you know, now James is in tech. He has an amazing podcast that we will dive into a little bit, but that's not where you started out. So let's back it up. Um, and talk about your pre-college days. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thank you so much for the kind words with that introduction. So pre-college days, I will absolutely date myself. I graduated from high school back in 2005. And I guess just to, to lay the eventual, spoil the story, so to speak, I didn't graduate college until 2012, but there's a lot of nuance in there that I'd love to to talk about to whatever extent you'd like. So Graduating from high school and moving on to college, there was very little intentionality in my decision, A, to go to college, and B, what to study. In hindsight, I probably shouldn't have done it at that time just because of that lack of intentionality, but it was kind of expected of me. Even though I was the first in my family to do it, I guess I was kind of put in that position where my parents were like, yeah, you know, you're the first that's going to be able to go to college. So you're going to go to college, even though they didn't use those exact words. So I guess those were the the built in expectations, at least in my mind going in. Uh, I think at some point I flirted with the idea of becoming a, a astronaut or something like that. And I was like, oh, maybe I'll try to get into MIT. Maybe I'll try to get into all these hard schools just because it's hard. So probably not the the right classification or way to select your college and certainly not in hindsight looking back. And I ended up going to Virginia Tech and that was largely based on my best friend at the time. You know, his brother went there. We had gone to a couple of football games. It was fun. I was like, well, he's going there. Why not? So I did that and I did. I applied to and was accepted into the College of Engineering. And that decision was just based on, well, what's the hardest thing I can apply to just to see if I can get in? And they did accept me. And so that's how I got in. And then again, there's an eight year path in there that I'm happy to get into. But I guess I'll pause here just in case you had any questions, because I know I, I laid a lot there with the, the lack of intentionality going in. You said something interesting. You wanted to take a certain path and apply to certain schools because it was hard. Why did you want to do the hard thing? That's a great question. I guess I've never really thought about that. I guess if I had to answer on the spot, it'd be to try to prove myself. I'm not sure to whom or why, to be quite honest. But yeah, I guess that was it. Maybe just to prove it to myself that I could do it. And I was partially successful because I did get in, but I wasn't completely successful because I did not graduate with that engineering degree. And so are there other hard things that you've done before? Was this the first time that you internally came to this place of, you know what, I really need to demonstrate that there's more to me than there than I've seen so far? Yeah, great question. Hard things before, I guess I'm trying to think back, you know, at this time in my life, 
I'm sure there were none really jump out. I mean, I was big into sports, big into baseball. We had a very successful, you know, little league team. We played in the state championship game, which was a lot of fun because, you know, we had a, uh, a team that maybe had 50 different kids to, to choose from. And we were up against schools with thousands. So that was a, a fun accomplishment. But to answer your question directly, I'm sure I did hard things in the past, but I'm not sure that those are related, but maybe on a, a subconscious level. Yeah. Well, let's dive deeper into that eight year journey through college. So anyone yeah. who's listening, they can tell that that's double the time that's typically expected. So what was your journey like? Yeah, no, absolutely. So going in and, and right before that, I was introduced to a, a video game where basically you could make real money playing a game. And that was intriguing to me. I'm, I'm not sure why. I, I had always liked video games growing up, but I bring that up to say that going into college, playing that game was taking up far more time, A, than it should have, and B, than I was actually dedicating to the classes and the coursework. And as a result of that, as you might expect, I didn't do great the first semester. And I think, again, zooming out just a little bit for a minute, all throughout high school, I was naturally talented only enough to kind of, I guess I didn't have to study that much to get passable grades and to do well. And at the time I thought that was an asset, but now I can see it was more of a liability because when I got to college, it's completely different. You definitely can't do that. I couldn't do that. You actually had to put in the work. And I think at that time I didn't know how to put in the work, Catherine. And I feel like you know, between then and now, I feel like I've learned how to learn. And I feel like that's one of the, the secrets to life, so to speak. But at that time, I did not know how to do that. So I floundered, you know, I was in this engineering degree, and all the courses that went with that calculus, you know, everything like that. And I was just I was floundering, I was put on academic probation after the first semester. And my parents, to their credit, they were trying to ask me how things were going. And I guess I was just being defensive and not telling them the whole truth. I was like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm struggling, but I'm doing the best I can. So yeah, I was playing too many video games. I was making money from that, but it was not probably the best use of my time at that time. And that went on for about a year. And it was actually, it was during, I think 2007. So about maybe a year and a half into that when there was a, uh, there was a mass shooting on the Virginia Tech campus. And I wasn't on campus at the time, so it didn't affect me directly. But as a result of that, I think the school came out with a policy for that semester where any students would have the option to basically wipe their grades for that semester for you know no questions asked. And because I basically didn't have a GPA because of all the video games I was playing, I did opt to do that. So that was a horrible event. And it I guess it salvaged a portion of my GPA just because I, I guess, used that opportunity to, to wipe that out. But it was at that point, Catherine, that I realized I wasn't on a sustainable path. And I actually took myself out of college at that point. So that was about, I guess, two years into it and went back home and lived with mom and dad for a little bit. A couple of pieces I want to dive deeper into. Um, one is you were mentioning how you realized that this what could have been an asset of being able to get passable grades without exerting a ton of effort turned into this liability. This could be rhetorical, James, but I'm curious if there was some part of you, because I think there's a part of all of us that recognizes our ultimate potential. Could there have been some part of you that knew that this would end up being a liability and wanted to push you or grant you the opportunity to break through that by pursuing some of those harder degrees or harder schools? Maybe. I, I guess, Catherine, I've never thought about it that way. It absolutely could have been that. And I think ultimately, if you fast forward to today, I feel like I was able to work through that, but it definitely wasn't a, a quick process. Yeah. Well, we can circle back to how you worked through that once we get to that point in time in your story. Um, but my second question is, you said that you engaged in this video game because you could make money. So it wasn't just something for pleasure, but it seems like this added a lot of value as well. Some folks as they're going through school have to earn money as well. So did this, was that your case? And does, did this supplement having like a job on campus or something like that? It did. And it did even before that, because I guess going back a little bit again, just to paint that picture, 
throughout high school, the during the summers, I was expected to work to basically save up money for college. And that was instilled by my parents. And that work used to be construction. And I was happy, as happy as anyone that is more of an introvert and happier on a computer could be doing construction work in the summer. I did learn a lot. But after sco- discovering this game, I realized, Catherine, that I could potentially make as much if not more money playing this game as opposed to that construction work. And I was able to convince my parents of that to let me try that. So the, I guess in that senior year, I was doing that during the summer and actually making money. So to answer your question directly, yes, it was a source of money. I did quite well in that, I guess, over the eight to 10 years in total that I played, I I was eventually able to put the down payment on the house that I live in now and have a nice, I guess, nest egg to help bootstrap life, quote unquote. So that was good. But if you, I guess, boil it down to the hourly wage for all the hours that I put in, it was, you know, more of a a menial type job. I probably could have done a lot better, you know, working and saving at a a standard job. So that's a very long answer to your question. But yes, I was using it as, as a source of income. So you move back in with mom and dad, and what are they thinking? You know, to their credit, they, for better or for worse, they were completely supportive. They were like, you do what you need to do. I guess they didn't really have a a base case either because I was the first one to kind of go to college, even though I didn't probably do it the right way in their mind. So they were very supportive. They probably in hindsight didn't know the, the questions to ask, or at least the questions that having been through what I went through that I would probably ask my daughter and potentially future children at that time. But yeah, they were extremely supportive. And I guess if I continue the story there, I kind of, I guess I, I wouldn't call it floundering, but I kind of kept sleepwalking the next year and a half. I, I did enroll in some community college courses. That was more of like a a mental justification of the time that I was spending at home. And again, there was no intentionality behind that. There was no ultimate degree I was working towards. It was just an amalgam of different courses where I could mentally and I guess actually tell my parents like, yeah, I'm taking courses at school while still spending most of my time on this game. And it was during that time, Catherine, where you know my health was absolutely in the toilet. I weighed 50 pounds more than I weigh today. In hindsight, it was probably the, the low point of my life, certainly to date. And some point, Along that journey, I literally woke up one morning and had that proverbial look in the mirror and kind of realized what I had become, both physically, mentally, and emotionally. And I was just like, you have to make a change. You're, you're better than this. And I guess to my credit, from that day forward, I did a complete 180. You know, I stopped eating the junk food. I, I didn't hang up the video game, but I guess I started to instill some guidelines around the time that I would play and I would truly treat it as the source of income as opposed to also, you know, enjoying it and becoming totally immersed in that. I got a little bit more intentional with the courses that I was taking at the community college and I also re-enrolled in Virginia Tech once I realized that I was ready to do that. And I have strong opinions in both directions as to the how stuck I felt I was. But before I go there, I, I guess I'll turn it back to you because I know I, I talked a lot there. That is great. I'm curious, James, just thinking through your story, you said you had that moment where you looked in the mirror proverbially and was like, okay, wow, we got to achieve something here. Now, there's many, many times in life when we become stuck and we say something's got to change. And maybe it changes for a day, maybe a week, maybe a year, and then we revert back. Did you make that decision and because it was a must, it just changed and you never looked back? Or did you have this up and down journey? I think a little bit of both. I think that was definitely that point of delineation where in my mind, everything had to change. And I kind of severed the ties with the, I guess, me before that time and me after that time. And in terms of like the fitness and nutrition, I made that, I guess, a core pillar of my life. And that wasn't, you know, going from zero to one and being perfectly intentional from that day forward. I eventually, and even to this day, I do abide by, you know, a pretty strict regimen in that. I didn't, that wasn't immediate. That wasn't overnight. I guess I had to discover with that. But in terms of the, the wallowing, and I guess up until that point, the lack of intentionality, I do feel like it was after that point, for whatever reason, 
that I haven't really thought about up until today. It was just a uh, a must, I guess, that you just you have to change things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've heard before that when it's positioned in our mind of oh, I really want to look good. I want to stop eating these things. I want to make more money. Whatever it is, when it's a want versus a must, that the brain responds to it very differently. Like if you must lift the car off of the person, you will find the superhuman strength to do so. But if you just need to or want to, the brain doesn't kick into gear. So I find it very interesting that this is congruent with your story of you had to. You must make a change. And it sounds like that's what happened. So tell me more. Yeah, no, absolutely. And so at that point, I re-enrolled into Virginia Tech. And I'll just pause for a quick second there, because at least at that time, that kind of spoke to my frustration with the public education system, just because I understand that because I did so poorly initially, I basically didn't have a GPA and I didn't have a GPA weighted over the course of like a year and a half. And because of that, at least what I knew at the time and what I still know today, no other college was going to touch me. And I can't really blame them, I guess. But in that regard, I felt kind of stuck. And I think what I failed to mention before I had taken myself out of that college, Catherine, is that I changed my majors from engineering to English because I realized it was a lot easier to kind of, I guess, BS your way through college as an English major as opposed to an engineering major. So at that point, I knew that I didn't want to teach English, but at the same time, I didn't know how to finish that college degree in any other capacity than to go back to Virginia Tech to do the best that I could to get straight A's, which is what I ultimately did for the most part. So just pausing on that because I'm super frustrated and I don't know if that's how things still are. And if they are, I guess I'm quite thankful that there are other opportunities for people to learn and to on-ramp into different professions as opposed to just that traditional college degree. So that kind of lays the, uh, I guess the mental gymnastics that were going through my mind at that time. But to, to jump forward in the story, I did go back to Virginia tech. I was still playing the game, but it was strictly now for money making and paying rent, paying tuition, which I was able to continue doing. I finished with, so having almost no GPA, I think I graduated at the end with an in major GPA of like a 3.7 or a 3.8, but cumulatively, I think it was like a 2.5 or a 2.6 just because of that first year and a half. And I guess I was so embarrassed at the end of that, I did not walk when I graduated in 2012, probably because of everything that I've been through. But I did graduate and uh, I, I have the diploma at this point in the story. Wow. How was it studying English going from engineering? Yeah, it, it was interesting because uh, I guess I'm not sure how much I actually learned. I probably, I almost certainly didn't learn as much as somebody that would go into that major with a desire to learn English and to learn like the, the British literature, Shakespeare, all the things that we touched. I'm probably not as polished as I would have been if I had truly immersed myself in that, but it it was fun. And I definitely think it's useful. I feel like I write well, and I feel like those years helped me establish that habit. And I do see that as a strength in just about anything that we do now, you know, being able to tell your story, which is what I, I talk about all the time. And, you know, being able to to put that into words, I feel like can really differentiate you from the pack. So I don't think I'm the best writer in the world, but I do think those years were useful, even if that's not what I would have chosen as my given major. Now you continued playing the game. So it was about what, eight, 10 years of playing. And yeah. that's a long time <laughs> to play a it game. Is. And while I know you moved to a place where it was providing income and so it was almost like just doing a job, did you ever get bored with playing that game that long? You know, I don't think I did. There was probably a short break there where I was playing other games, but maybe because it was so open-ended that it just kept my interest. And because it was it was like a real-time game with other players from around the world, you know, you establish those relationships with other people, real people that exist. And I guess that kind of leads into the next part of the journey, if you want to go there, is after college, again, I knew I didn't want to be an English major and I wasn't ready to 
I guess, relegate myself to just a, a random cubicle. And I had a decent amount of money saved up from this game, was still playing the game. I was as remote as you could be at the time, just because all I needed was a computer and an internet connection. And this game was based out of uh, Gothenburg, Sweden. So I had met virtually, I guess, several people who I considered some of my closest friends now through this game that lived in Sweden. I was like, well, why don't you just go to Sweden? So I I ended up booking a one-way ticket to Sweden. And yeah, I ended up staying there for a year, which was an absolutely phenomenal experience. Wow. That's amazing. I know that a lot of people form relationships virtually. So you had never seen these people in person until you booked this one-way ticket, right? That's right. Okay. And were how were you feeling at the time? Were you excited or what was going through your mind as you're about to meet these folks? Yeah, I was excited, I guess. In hindsight, I probably should have been nervous. I, I really don't think I was just because I had talked to some of these people for almost a decade at this point, Catherine. So yeah, I... I I don't think I was as nervous as I probably should have been, but I was more excited for the unknown and excited to explore, I guess. So my family or a part of my family is Swedish. So I personally am very curious to know what was it like visiting Sweden and um, what did you do there? How long did you stay? Yeah, it was absolutely amazing. I wouldn't trade any of this story for anything just if nothing else, for that year in Sweden alone, because I don't think I would have gone there otherwise. And it it was amazing. I went there and I actually ended up sleeping on my friend's couch for probably 10 or 11 months out of that year. So, and I was okay with that. Like I I didn't see that as a bad thing. I don't know that it's a bad thing anyway, but it, it was fun. And in terms of what I did, so I was still trying to I guess, make a little bit of food and beer money at the time, just because, you know, I didn't have any other expenses, so to speak. So I was playing the game for that. I had kept up the the workout regimen over there. And I will say that the, the quality of food and definitely the water as well over there just seems so much cleaner than, than what we have in the States. And, uh, as, as a quick aside, I guess I was in some of the best shape of my life at that time. And that's probably also a, a byproduct of we walked everywhere. Like my friend didn't have a car and that was okay. You know, he lived in a, a smaller town, Halstavik, which is about, I think an hour and a half, maybe two hours Southwest, I think of Stockholm. So, you know, we would walk to the grocery store, we'd walk to the gym, you know, we'd come back from the grocery store with you know, hands full of groceries and I didn't know any better. So I didn't think anything of it. So that was amazing. I got to travel to a few different parts of Sweden just because of the different friends that I had made in that game. I got to visit the game headquarters and the the CEO at the time in Gothenburg, which was a lot of fun to do that. I was able to volunteer at schools, help some of my friends build summer cabins out on the lake, spend many awesome nights out at that lake, you know, over campfire, just having a great time enjoying life. And yeah, I wouldn't trade that experience and that perspective for, for anything. I think I'm booking my ticket after this. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely go to Halstavik. That sounds amazing. I mean, just the whole experience, the food, the nature, walking. I studied abroad in the Czech Republic and it was the same thing. I think many European countries, you know, you walk to the store and you do it on a regular basis and you're preparing fresh food. And I just love that lifestyle. And it's nice to know that you were able to continue your healthy habits because I'm curious at this point, were you able to drop the weight? It sounds like you were in the best shape. So you had really made that transformation. Yeah, I guess I glossed over that when I had brought that up. So after I had that realization backing up a a few years prior to going back to Virginia Tech, I lost, I think, 50 or 60 pounds over the summer. So I actually, I guess I swung too far on that pendulum. I did, I think at the time it was P90X was the program I did. And yeah, I I got, I guess, too thin and I wasn't strong at all. So at some point that pendulum swung back just a little bit. I established a a regular uh, resistance training weight routine and I was able to maintain that from that point forward and into Sweden as well. So yes, I was able to, to keep that. P90X is a hard 
program. How did you land on that one? It is. How, how did I land on that one? I, I don't know. You know, it was, I guess it was, I'm sure it was marketing. So whatever Beachbody, I think, <laughs> at least owned it at the time. I think they still do. Uh, whatever they were doing in terms of marketing, it definitely worked. And uh, because I'm sure, Catherine, at that point, I was Googling how to get fit, how to lose weight. And I'm sure that was probably one of the top hits that I found. And that led me to that program. And to its credit, it did help me shed the weight. It didn't get the exact results that I wanted, but it, it definitely helped. So how long, moving back into your story, how long did you stay in Sweden? Yeah. So long story short, almost a year and a little bit more nuanced take. It was funny because I... Uh, I think you can go there for 90 days as an American without a visa, without anything like that. And again, I booked a one-way ticket. Initially, I didn't really have a plan and I didn't know how long I was going to stay. So I go there and maybe it's two months in and my friend is probably the one that brought it up more than me realizing that I couldn't stay there indefinitely without doing something about it. So I ended up applying for a six month extension, not fully expecting to stay for the full six months, but I did. And what's very funny at that point, after those, I guess after five of those six months was up, I still didn't, I don't know, I was having so much fun. Catherine, I didn't want to go home yet, as bad as that may sound. And so we were like, well, maybe I'll just apply for another extension. And that's where it gets kind of interesting because I think Long story short, what I found is that most people don't apply for extensions twice. I don't think you can do that, but there was a little bit of nuance there where you are awaiting your final decision. You're allowed to remain in country until you get that decision. And that decision was expected to probably take a month. So it was at that point, probably 10 months or 11 months into my stay at Sweden that I realized, okay, you know, it's probably time to go back to the States to see friends and family back home and to, I guess, figure out life, quote unquote. So that was largely the impetus behind me going home for, I think it was Christmas of 2013, if I'm remembering the years correctly. And did you figure out all of life? No, no. Once I figure <laughs> out all of life, I'll be happy to, to share that with you. But what I'm, what I think I've have figured out is that it's, you know, figuring out things as we go, you're having a plan and then being open to serendipitous things that crop up in pursuit of said plan that, that really give life uh, meaning for me and for us, I think. So no, I don't have it all figured out yet, unfortunately. And I only say that because I know that phrase is common, right? Especially when we're young, we want to be able to figure yeah. it out. It's this final destination. Once I've got it, once I understand the game, you know, that kind of mindset, then I will dot, dot, dot. And here you and I both are farther down the line and still have not figured it out. So I just want to make sure that any young folk out there understand it doesn't come like it's a journey, yeah. not a destination. Yes, 100%. And I, you took the words right out of my mouth there. I, I did want to jump in and say that because it was, you know, with just about anything in life, I think it, it is important to embrace that journey and not just the destination because in hindsight, I think reaching any destination, I don't feel like it's it's as glorious as we think that it will be in pursuit of said destination. And I feel like if that's where we plan to derive all of our meaning, I, I feel like we're going to be a bit empty when we reach that goal. So I'm so glad you brought that up. So where do you find meaning? Yeah. So I guess meaningful relationships now, you know, and that I guess that started, you know, even in that virtual capacity in the game that I was playing. But now, you know, working at LinkedIn, even again in a remote capacity, which apparently is right up my lane, uh, you know, the relationships that I've built with the people in my cohort, people like you that aren't in my cohort, but that I have been introduced to through the LinkedIn platform. So, yeah, I guess that would be my direct answer is just the, the relationships and the hopefully the, the impact that you have on people. I love that relationships and impact that speaks to me as well, just in terms of what adds sustenance to life. Um, so I think that that's beautiful. You come back from Sweden, it's Christmas 2013. The family's probably excited to see you. <laughs> and then I think what, they were. <laughs> what happens after that? Yeah. So trying to think back what happened through that. 
I'm pretty sure at this point, I still didn't know what I wanted to quote unquote do with the rest of my life. I was definitely mentally, I was in a good state You know, I was in good shape. I felt like things were as good as they could be given the fact that I had no crystal clear direction, quote unquote. So I think, you know, it was shortly after that, actually, a few of my Swedish friends came over to the States and we went down to Florida because I hadn't taken enough leisure time of late. We went down there and I got to introduce them to America in the, uh, in the Florida Keys. So that was fun for a couple of weeks. And I think at some point shortly thereafter, I thought that I might want to be an occupational therapist. And maybe that kind of lends itself to the, I guess, trying to help people physically. And so I had started to pursue more intentional co uh, community college courses at this point. And I think in hindsight, I still, that wasn't a burning desire, quote unquote, because it was during that time where I finally broke down and decided to basically push myself out of my comfort zone and stop paying for college and trying to to not pay for something that I didn't know that I wanted to do and get paid to basically put myself out of my comfort zone and learn something new. So it was shortly after that where I took myself out of that college courses and I actually went to work on a tugboat, which wasn't a totally random decision because that's actually the profession that both my dad and my brother are in as well. I had resisted it up until this point just because it requires you to be away from home for upwards of six to nine months out of the year. And I didn't want to do that to my future family. But at this point in my story, I guess I didn't have that future family yet. And I guess that wasn't a justifiable excuse anymore. I was ready to push myself, see if I could do it again. I guess we're returning to that. And again, more importantly, to try to get paid to learn something completely different. So that's what I did. I went to work on a tugboat, completely blue collar. And it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't driving the boat. It was tying up the boat, handling lines, tying up barges, all of the, uh, the rough things that you may or may not be able to imagine, which was very fun and rewarding in its own way. So that was next. We're going to get to the tugboat because this is super unique. But I want to ask, were you done playing the game at this point? Great question. To an extent, yes, but I hadn't, I guess, sold out all of the the items that were required, basically the overhead required to, to make money in the game. So it was kind of put on ice, which was making me a little bit uneasy because there was that opportunity cost of that, that invested money being tied up in the game. So I was kind of playing it and it was during the, I guess, tugboat tenure that I ended up selling out completely from the game. And what led you to making that decision? I guess it was somewhere during that time that I realized in that game, we were constrained by the rules that the developers had instilled. And I had also realized that now I was working a real job. I was, I was in this thing called life and it was a much bigger game and I needed to find out those rules. So I think it was both of those things playing a part of it. And I realized that I was tired of playing by someone else's rules, at least in terms of me playing that game. So that was largely the impetus behind that, aside from those the opportunity cost of those invested funds in there. So that those were largely the uh, I guess the drivers for me getting out of that and then embracing this new workforce as the the new game of life, so to speak, and to try to figure that out. And when you let that go, were there any? emotions around that process because that's something that has been part of your life for a very large time yeah not as many as i guess you would think which i don't know if that speaks to to me in any capacity or not I, i've never talked to a, a psychologist about that but uh yeah no i mean i was there were definitely parts of me that didn't want to let it go but not as much as you might think given the the, the tenure that i had spent in that game and in that that world basically. So no. And maybe that was helped by the fact that most of the close friends that I had made through that game, I still had them on Facebook Messenger. So I was still able to, to talk with them. So you didn't lose the relationships, but moved on from the game. And now you're working tugboats. And for anyone who doesn't know what a tugboat might be, could you describe it a little bit more? Yeah, great question. So a, a tugboat, I guess most people can probably envision a, a boat. It's a structure, either aluminum or steel that floats in the water. 
And a tugboat is basically a, uh, I guess you could think about them as like a, a linebacker or like a really strong boat. And they're the main purpose of the, at least the boats that I work on are basically to be able to pull many, many, many times their weight and to be able to transport cargo from either from A to B or to, to make runs, basically dredging out, meaning deepening channels that many of the big cargo ships coming into the major ports like Miami use. So that's what a tugboat uh, does. And I've never had to describe that before. So did that. I don't know if I did it justice or not, but that's the best I have. Yeah, that was great. So it's kind of dredging out those channels very powerful, small and mighty, but able to clear some of that, that undersea land. Right. Yeah. And so it doesn't do the actual dredging itself. It kind of works to facilitate that by, I guess, the barges, quote unquote. And I'm happy we can go down this rabbit hole if you'd like, but the uh, they would be married, meaning they'd be tied up to barges and those barges would have the sediment and everything filled up in those barges and then our boat would take it and we would go offshore and this was fun because it was almost like a video game there was a little cell on the laptop where the captain had to hit the button just at the right time to dump the contents of that barge to fill this predestined spot out in the ocean and as you might expect i gravitated towards that catherine and most of the boats that I worked on, they asked me if I could help them, even though that was far outside the job description of what I was supposed to be doing to try to help them hit this target. Because a lot of those people in that industry that were good at driving boats, you know, computers weren't, I guess, natural for them. And I definitely enjoyed that aspect of it as well. That is so fun. So you almost replicated pieces of the game into your real life job. I did. I did. And I, it's funny because I chose that profession in an attempt to push myself out of my comfort zone. But it's so funny because I can see in hindsight, I got comfortable pretty quick thereafter. And I guess it was a function of trying to draw similarities from my, my past experience and to extrapolate that on the new environment. And what happens if you didn't press the button at the right time? <laughs> Yeah. So it's not like anything bad happened immediately. Uh, the barge would open up and it would go where it went, but the owners and at the time, the company that I soon went to work for, who was actually subcontracting our company, they would not be happy because they had basically, those were the rules that they had established with the army Corps of engineers. They're moving, you know, the sediment from location a to location B location B was a cleared spot. You're not supposed to drop it outside of that. So it did happen. It absolutely did happen. And yeah, those were the uh, the ramifications. It was more of a, I guess if they did it too much, the, the captains maybe let go. It was more of like a financial implication. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So what were some of the lessons that you learned about yourself and life as you're now in this different position, you're out on the water, you're working the tugboat? All right, great question. Um, I think in hindsight, looking back, being exposed to, it had started in Sweden, but definitely also on the boats, being exposed to different cultures, different people from different backgrounds of life, and definitely treating everyone with respect. I feel like I've usually been pretty good with that. I'm kind of a people pleaser by default, but it's interesting because I see a lot of people that don't treat people well, or they treat people poorly. And it's interesting too, because several of the people that I worked with on these boats had a reputation for not being fun to work with. And I found it quite fascinating because when I worked with those people, I didn't have that same, I guess, thought about working with them. And that's not to say that I was this great person that brought the best out of them, but I, I do feel like I was able to learn how to get along with just about anyone, which I feel like is an absolutely invaluable skill to learn in life. Now, you're saying you're learning this while you're on the boat, but I'm curious, when you were playing the game and you're interacting with so many different personalities in this um, virtual ecosystem, did you actually start learning any of those skills there or was this really fresh when you were on the tugboat? Great question. I probably did, probably in a little bit different of a way, just because in that capacity, it was all virtual and all avatar to avatar, so to speak. But yeah, I think if I had to answer that, I would say that probably 
started there and it definitely didn't hurt to have that experience when it came to both Sweden and working on the boats with the different people. So you're learning all of these different skills about um, interacting with people and understanding how do you show up in any situation with any dynamic and really make it work. So maybe some conflict resolution, maybe speaking to who the person really is. Did that help you with your job? Did it move you into more of a leadership position? What kind of outcome came from that? Yeah, I think both of those. So it definitely helped me with conflict resolution. A lot of the conflicts that probably would have arisen in normal situations didn't just because I think I I learned, you know, people are interesting. Everyone has their own nuance, the things that they like to do, the things that they don't like to do. I know there was one particular gentleman who he was a little bit older. He was a little bit more heavy set, and the expectations for the deckhands, which I was and he was at the time, where you basically take turns going up on this barge to help land it and tie it up when we get there. And he came to me very early on the first shift that we worked together. And I forget how he did it, but he basically, he kind of told me that he wasn't going to do it, but he didn't do it like that. He kind of asked if I could do it, I think. And I guess for a split second from a, a terms of like, like fairness and equity, my, my initial reaction was like, no, we each need to do it. But I guess I also had the foresight to zoom out a little bit. And to think, no, I, I don't mind going up there. It's more exercise. That'll be fun. It's fun being up there, getting to to watch the sunrise, you know, and to to do that anyway. So I feel like that was just a small example of figuring out different people, what they liked, what they didn't like. And so it helped me there, but it also helped me because I noticed that he kind of picked up the slack in other areas where he maybe wouldn't have otherwise. So yeah, I, I feel like that was an example of how that helped me. And I think I've rambled so much now that I forgot your original question that I come close to, to answering it. That was great. Thank you, James. It's interesting okay. how you were able to play to each other's strengths. So he identified an area where he was weak and then leveraged the conversation to ask you to step in. But then he didn't yes. back out. He wasn't being lazy. He picked up slack elsewhere. I think that right. dynamic is beautiful. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think a lot of the people that had worked with him would have had that initial reaction to just say, no, you know, you need to go up there half the time. I go up there half the time. And in that situation, you would have that tension where neither neither person would be happy. And that's probably how some of that reputation uh, was conveyed to me. But luckily, I, I didn't experience that. That kind of plays to the conversation of equality versus equity. Equality is you both would have spent time doing it, but equity is playing to each other's strengths and saying, no, I'm, I'm happy to lean in a little bit more here and the other person's happy to lean in a little bit more there. Um, that's really cool. How many years did you spend on the boat? Yeah. So the plan was to put in the time and to work my way up just because that was my current thing and I wasn't hating it. I was getting paid to learn something new. And so to do that, I think if I remember correctly, I basically had to spend the equivalency of maybe a year and a half of days, quote unquote, 12 hour days working on the boat. So that was the plan to do that. And then to move to the next level, the able body seaman, and then to do another year and then move on to the mate. And then I guess to move on to the captain, I ended up, I did the first year and a half and I became the able seaman. Maybe it was a year. Maybe it wasn't a year and a half that I got that quote unquote promotion and the, the pay doubled. It still wasn't great, but it was something. And at this point, uh, I guess I was fortunate enough, Catherine, to have saved up enough money through the game where I wasn't working for money. As silly as that seems, I was working more for the experience, even though it wasn't something that I was truly passionate about. And I recognize that I was extremely fortunate to be in that situation, but I, I feel like many people, if you make different adjustments in your life, I feel like you can get to a similar position where you don't, I don't want to say you don't have to work for money because at the end of the, the day, we have to do that. But I feel like you can optimize different areas such that that's not the only factor in your work. So back to your question directly, it was about a year and a half into that where I was planning to, to make the next step and I had an opportunity to move over to the management side of the fleet. It was that company that was subcontracting ours down in Miami. And I basically had a, a very 
initially anyway, an informal interview that I didn't even know was an interview. I was cooking uh, as a deckhand at the time, and there was another guest from uh, Great Lakes Dredge and Dock was the company that subcontracted ours. He was on the boat. It wasn't that abnormal. I made him dinner. He was asking me questions that weren't normally asked of deckhands, just in terms of interest, things that I like to do. And I think at some point I realized what he might be doing. And long story short, he informally floated the idea of working with him, which was absolutely a uh, an interesting, he, he was a great guy, is a great guy. And uh, so it was informal and I was like, yeah, I'd be open to that. So about six months after that, I had the opportunity to have the actual interview and I met both this gentleman and his boss. I had that interview. It wasn't, it was so funny because it wasn't anything like any of the technical interviews that I've done for the profession that I'm in now. It was still very informal. And uh, long story short, I was offered that job. I realized that, you know, there's a little bit of hesitation there because I was on this path, but it wasn't one I was passionate about. And I was like, well, I can always go back if I have to. And I was kind of like, why not? So I ended up moving from, I guess, the blue collar aspect of working on those boats to a little bit more white collar, but not totally, of managing the fleet of boats as an apprentice superintendent. You mentioned that he interviewed you informally. You're making him dinner. And then six months later, you get the opportunity to do the actual interview. Why six months? Yeah, I think that's a function of the company. And they were just extremely slow with everything that they did. And it was interesting because, you know, he stayed in contact and it's almost like he wanted to start working together before it was official. And I don't, that was nothing malicious in his mind. It was just, I think he recognized how I might be able to help him in the job. And I recognized that it would be a lot of fun, but to answer your question directly, I think it's just a function of how slow uh, older corporations might move. And it was just a, a very drawn out process. Gotcha. Okay. So you move into this new position and then what happens? Yeah. So it's fun. Um, it's funny because just like pushing myself out of my comfort zone and then getting comfortable quickly, when I read the job requirements, Catherine, it was go around to boats, teach captains how to perform maintenance on their boats. I didn't know anything about any of that. And both my manager and his manager knew that, but they also, I guess, thought that I could figure it out. And I felt like I could figure it out as much as I needed to. But it's funny because looking back from that point for the next six years where I'm actually working my way up in this role and a few roles beyond that, I did maybe 10% of the things listed in the job description. And I found ways to leverage my strengths and my passions, like the computer work and trying to automate things and create systems I basically, I was doing the work that they were asking, but I was also showing them different things that I might be able to do. And it was so funny because in hindsight, it wasn't impressive technically, but in their mind, you would think that I invented fire and they really latched onto that. And I really latched onto that because I enjoyed doing those things. I remember showing my boss uh, Google Sheets. He used to send Excel sheets around to the different managers of the boats and they would have to wait for someone to send something back to update one row etc. And to anyone listening, this is probably a no brainer. Yeah. Google sheets. Many people can work on the same thing at once. They didn't know that. And even though I had never really worked with Google sheets, I at least knew that. And I was confident that I could figure out how to help them make the system. And in hindsight, that's what I did. Wow. Um, that's fantastic. And so even that minor adjustment in the way that they were working had a major impact and they saw that as incredibly valuable. Yeah. Yeah, no. And then to their credit, they were open to that flexibility, I guess, as opposed to being more close minded and, you know, more stringent as to no, we hired you to do this thing. This is what you're going to do. That's not what I experienced. And I'm so grateful for that. There's two pieces I want to highlight there. One for my own journey working on internal tools at LinkedIn. I have recently changed from the perspective of you've got to do something drastic and something big in order to make an impact to realizing that sometimes it's just those little micro changes, such as moving from one program to another, from sending it back and forth to being able to collaborate at once that actually has massive impact. And we don't have to look for the giant dramatic things. We can just make small tweaks. So I love that you highlighted that piece. 
And then also the flexibility of the company to not keep you in a box and say, no, this is what you're here for. Do this because you might have other strengths or other ideas and being willing to receive that and lean into that was intelligent on their part. Yeah, hundred percent. And just to, to piggyback off that a little bit in hindsight, our division, which grew shortly thereafter, it, it was almost like a, a startup within this great monolith of a, an older company that was so slow moving. That wasn't us. And I think that's a, a credit to my manager and his manager who eventually became my manager that he, he was open to the change. He was open to the, that almost like that startup mentality of, you know, starting things completely from first principles, uh, how to do things as opposed to just tiny iterations. So yeah, it, it was a lot of fun. You're kind of like an entrepreneur. Yeah, I guess, you know, I, I always, that's how I used to sell my time playing that game. I definitely didn't tell people that I was a professional gamer. I told them that I was an account manager for, and I, you know, <laughs> went into the, the details of how I, I did that. But yeah, no, I, I can definitely see it and appreciate it through those lenses or through that lens. So tell me about the rest of your time working on the corporate side of the tugboat company. Yeah. So it was during that time, Catherine, and it was 2019, I was introduced to programming. And I guess I joined the company in 2016. So it was during prior to programming, even I know I jumped the gun, but that's just because I'm so passionate about programming. Prior to that, I kind of built out this Google Sheet dashboard of sorts, and it helped us manage a fleet. We were given more and more responsibility because we were, I guess, more efficient than other people had been with managing the fleet. And that was fun. It was a lot of fun. I got to travel everywhere. And at this point, I yeah, I guess I was married at this point. I did not have a child yet, but the travel requirements for this job were starting to weigh on me a little bit because even though I wasn't on the tugboat where I was away from home for half of the year, you know, I guess I was away one to two weeks out of the month, not every month. It, it was only slightly better, even if they weren't as long. And so jumping ahead a little bit, I was learning a lot. I was, again, learning a lot about different people all across the country, people in Louisiana, Alabama, uh, New Jersey, you know, different personalities, completely different personalities, but it was a lot of fun. And I've always enjoyed working with different people from different cultures, just learning about them, learning what they like, learning what they don't like, and just sitting back and observing, I guess I've always enjoyed that. And I feel like that definitely helped me in that role because again, I would argue I wasn't technical. I would argue I wasn't good, quote unquote, in terms of the traditional definition of a maintenance superintendent and an eventual assistant maintenance manager. I didn't have that technical know-how that many of those people had that were in that role. But I do feel like I knew how to talk with different people, even different people doing the work at the shipyards that we would go to. I feel like I knew how to try to get the best out of different people and how to get that information out of people, not in a negative way, but to try to draw in the knowledge that different people provided and to appreciate their perspective. So I feel like that's translatable to any industry. And I definitely appreciate that part of my journey. And yeah, so 2019, I discovered programming and I had my light bulb moment. I realized that I had missed my calling up until that point. And because I'm working in this startup like division, I was able to start integrating these things that I was learning and the the Google Sheet dashboard that I had built, it became even more efficient. We now, I incorporated like a Python web scraper so we could see our fleet in real time, which was a lot of fun for me anyway. And I was having fun, but I also realized that I, I wanted to become a software engineer and they were kind of letting me be a makeshift software engineer, but I didn't know how to challenge myself in that capacity because I was having to come up with all the, the questions to try to push myself. And at least in that tiny realm, like I was the smartest guy in the room just because I was the only guy in the room trying to push myself in that direction. And I didn't like that. And shortly before that, the person that I was working with, the company kind of forced him to retire, which wasn't as bad as it sounds because he was... I think mentally he was already checked out anyway, and he was ready to go. He had, he had actually put in his, uh, his resignation letter for a few months out. So it wasn't as fun, I guess, traveling without 
this guy, Bob Peterson, just in case he's ever out there listening. Those years were some of the best of my life just for the different trips that we made across the country. So things weren't the same. I wasn't able to be challenged in the direction that I wanted to become. And again, this travel became more and more stringent where I would have to travel more and more. And I don't think my wife wasn't pregnant at the time, but we were talking about soon starting to try to, to have a family. So I knew that something had to change. So I learned programming and I realized pretty soon that I wanted to make a, a pivot. But I think at this point in the journey, I was afraid to make that pivot. Wow. Well, shout out to Bob. <laughs> I could see the way that your sure. face lit up as you were talking about him just to have a joyful travel companion. It is so interesting that you mentioned being the smartest guy in the room in terms of programming and having to challenge yourself in that way and then not liking it. Now, there's that common saying that you don't want to be the smartest person in the room. You want to be in a different room. And yet at the same time, internally, we all try to be the smartest person in the room, the expert, intelligent, esteemed by our peers. It's a weird psychological dichotomy. So how then did you move yourself into a different room? Yeah. So I was taking these, I guess, an amalgam of different courses online without a lot of clear direction. In hindsight, I was still learning valuable things that still help me today. But I probably put up with that job for at least a year longer than I should have. And it just got to the point where I wasn't, I guess, willing to, to, to be away from home and to travel like that and to do that because I realized that I was living a lie and I was tired of living a lie. And I was hesitant to make the change because you know I was making good money. I was supported. I love the manager that I worked with. If everybody in the company was like him, I would probably still be there today for better or for worse. I wouldn't change anything about how my story has played out, but not everybody in the company was him. His manager was uh, much more of like a boots on the ground kind of a guy where if you weren't traveling at 5 a.m. Monday morning and you, you better not be coming home Friday until it's like 10 p.m. or something like that, like all week on the road kind of a deal. And that's more of like the the work hard versus the work smart mentality. And it was just antiquated thinking in my mind. So long story short there, I got tired of that. And I was kind of looking into boot camps, which I had heard about before. I was a little bit apprehensive because, you know, I, I had heard bad stories, which I guess are easy to hear on the internet. And I didn't know how to make that selection, but I, I ended up, I thought I was going to potentially go with Hack Reactor, which perhaps some of the listeners may have heard of, perhaps not, but they're a more well-known bootcamp. And I actually did their pre-course before I had made the decision to leave. And I was planning to do that, Catherine, but I had applied to their scholarship and in hindsight, I put together what I thought was this great how to carve a pumpkin because we had to teach how to do something. And so it did teach me video editing skills, which I appreciated. And I thought I put together a great presentation, jumping to the punchline. I didn't get the scholarship. And even though I could have at the time, I did not want to pony up 25 grand to spend the next three months for 10 hours a day in my office coding when there might be another path. So I found Springboard, which was a different option. And Colt Steele was the instructor and his course on Udemy was the very first Python course that I was ever introduced to. I love his teaching style. So I knew he was the one. And it was around that time that I found Springboard that I had my, I guess, snapping moment with my former job. And I, it was probably a Monday morning after our regular Monday morning meeting where my manager called me and I could tell that something was up because I could hear it in his voice where he basically asked me if I was willing to go to, I think it was Alabama that week, even though we had talked about I was going to work from home. And long story short, that had come from above him. And even though I love the people over in Alabama, I, I was tired of you know plans changing and having to be away from home. So there was a long pause on my end. And I think at that point, I told him, yeah, I'll do that. And then he asked me what was wrong. And for whatever reason, I finally had that courage to be honest with him, let him know where I was at, let him know that my intentions were, you know, a month from now to basically, I guess I said it better than this, but sever ties and to embrace this career transition. And to his credit, I got a, a lot of support from him. He told me almost immediately he knew 
that I was upset. He knew that I'd been unhappy for a while and he fully supported that. So it was at that point that I, I guess I made that decision. I did go to Alabama that week and that was probably the, the best travel week of my life just because I had this relief now that I, I had this plan. It was a conscious decision into a, a field and direction that I wanted to go. And I had finally mustered the courage to, to burn the proverbial ships and, and to pursue that. So that was the point. And that was, I guess, October, November of 2021 that that happened. And that boot camp started January 1st, the following year. You mentioned that you had been there for a year too long. How did you come to that conclusion? Because I know that there are a lot of people out there who are in jobs and they have probably been there quote unquote, too long, whether they have just are no longer contributing like impacts or they're not passionate, they don't have the energy, whatever their personal reason may be. There are people who are trying to make that decision for themselves right now. Of, is it time to move on? And often when we have change, we feel fear. And that fear we sometimes use as an indicator of no, stay where you are because the next thing could be scary. But really, sometimes what we register as fear is actually excitement. Uh, the brain doesn't always know the difference between the two. So I'd love to hear, how did you come to that conclusion? Yeah, I think I definitely did feel that fear up until that point. And it, it must have been around that time, Catherine, that I was introduced to, to Jeff Bezos's regret minimization framework, which for your listeners, just in case they're not familiar with it, my uh, recollection of that is basically you know, you picture yourself when you're 80 or whatever arbitrary age you are sitting out on your rocking chair on Mars or wherever it may be when we are actually at that age, hopefully, but looking back at your life and hopefully making decisions up until that point that you don't regret. And once I was introduced to that concept, I realized that, you know, I was on a safe path. I would make great money. I could retire a millionaire and by all accounts be successful. But if I was that 80 year old looking back, I would not have been happy or fulfilled because I felt like I was living a lie. I wasn't living up to whatever kind of potential that I felt like I could reach. And even if not potential, just a, a different profession that really called to me. And I knew I would regret if I didn't at least try. So at some point shortly after being introduced to that, I guess the courage finally outweighed the, the fear that you mentioned that I absolutely felt and I, I felt empowered to to make that decision. And I'm so glad that I did. I kind of, you know, I always say that I wouldn't change anything. I kind of wish I would have made that change a little bit sooner, but I'm, I'm so glad that I did. So you made that change. You found your ideal boot camp, got started in January of that year. And then is it a three month boot camp? No. So it's actually officially, it's a nine month self-paced boot camp. And I think that's kind of tailored towards the people that are working as well. And I debated for a minute doing that, but I also knew myself and knew that all the many courses that I had taken while working, I was super frustrated because I was learning great things. And then right when I was on the cusp of implementing them in a new project, I was pulled away to go travel or to do something that didn't light me up. So I knew that that approach wasn't going to work for me. So to answer your question directly, it was a, an officially a nine month program, but it was self-paced and they also had a pay by month option. So I was like, okay, this is going to be my new full-time job. I'm going to do eight hours a day minimum every day, at least Monday through Friday. And that's going to be my thing. And I maintained that at least for the first three months. And I think I got about probably 60, 70% of the way through those first three months. So I was on a, a torrid pace and it's interesting because I hadn't mentioned it. It was shortly before that. So I left my job November of that previous year. My wife was still employed. She was also pregnant with our first child, which was also a part of what caused me to make this change when I did, which may, I guess on the surface, seem a little bit counterintuitive where you have this pending responsibility. You're going to quit your job and embrace something new. I, I feel like when I, I did that reflection, Catherine, I realized if I didn't do it then, I, I may not ever do it just because that was the time. I, I felt confident that I could figure it out even if I didn't have that discrete path. So November, I leave my job. My wife is still employed. End of December, she's a government contractor. Her contract concludes she loses her job. So that wasn't in the plan, but I guess to both of our credit, we we kept going. I didn't 
relent and go groveling back to the the previous job and try to get that position back, I kept pushing forward. And thankfully, we had had the, I guess, financial wherewithal to save up and to to plan for this eventuality. So we were in a good position financially to be able to do what we were doing and to execute the plan. So first three months, about 60, 70% of the way through, she's pregnant with our first child. And it was, I guess, when I was about 65% of the way through that, she goes into labor about a week and a half earlier than expected. So I actually have to put the boot camp on pause. And I understand I'm jumping around a little bit. At this point in the boot camp, I'd applied to both LinkedIn, which spoilers, some may know how that works out, and also another company. So, And I hadn't heard back from either. I put the boot camp on pause to try to be present for my wife and for our new daughter who was born. And that was a really interesting, scary time, I guess. And yeah, it, it turned out okay, but it wasn't always immediately evident that it would. Was it financially scary or you have this new human being and you're nervous? What was scary about that? Probably more of the latter. I'm much more conservative in terms of the financial aspect. I was certainly aware that we didn't have anything coming in, but we were also in a great spot in terms of all that we had put away in preparation for this moment. So it was on my mind, but it was much more of the, you know, I was noticing while I was enjoying trying to be present with my wife and new daughter that these coding skills that I built up, they were starting to atrophy just because I wasn't using them during this time with the boot camp on pause. I wasn't doing it every day. And you know, the thought crossed my mind where, you know, if this LinkedIn interview or the other interview doesn't work out, I'm confident I can ramp back up, but it's going to be a lot harder to be nice if one of these two really works out. I hear back from the first one and they ended up not going with me. And that's interesting too, because it was during that interview process that I let them know basically my entire situation, even though I don't think you're obligated to do that. I let them know that my wife was pregnant and that we were going to most likely that company offered paternity leave, which was great. And I basically wanted to be completely transparent, even though, again, I, I don't know that they're allowed to ask that. I, I felt like it was the, the right thing to do. I don't know if that's why they didn't go with me. I would expect it was a contributing factor. But anyway, I'm very glad they didn't go with me because if they would have, Catherine, there's a, a decent chance that I may have said yes to them. And I don't hear back from LinkedIn for until probably three weeks after that. And I would have probably felt pretty bad leaving that company that took a chance on me for for LinkedIn. But thankfully, the, the first one did not go with me. And I eventually hear back from LinkedIn and they would like to move forward with me as an apprentice software engineer. And I was just absolutely elated. You get the position at LinkedIn. That is fantastic. And I love that Um, Even though it might have been disappointing at the time, you still um, heard that no from the other company because sometimes rejections are crucial for our path and where we are supposed to go. And so being able to have that rejection actually opened you up to a bigger opportunity, which you have now been in for a good bit of time and are thoroughly enjoying. So you have your first child. Um, you receive this offer at LinkedIn, and then how does your life change? Because those are two very big moments in time. They are, and it was the at least the LinkedIn, initially the LinkedIn job offer, it was a little bit bittersweet only because the initial expectation is for me to ro- relocate to Omaha, Nebraska, which is the office that my team was based out of. And that's 1,300 miles from Virginia. So I was elated to be offered the job. I wasn't thrilled about having to, I guess, rip our daughter out of her support network here in Virginia. And, you know, my family, they were supportive, but they were definitely distraught at that as well. So it was almost like I definitely went through different feelings of guilt during that time because I guess being self-critical looking back, I had this safe management career that I was in where I didn't have to relocate. And now it's almost like a selfish thing for me to try to pursue this passion and have to to relocate. But thankfully, about two months into the job, LinkedIn changed their policy where apprentice engineers would have the option to remain remote. And I was just blown away. That was like something out of a dream because that was the only reason that the the LinkedIn offer wasn't like the the best thing on the planet to have ever happened. So at that point, it was. 
Wow. So the policy change just kind of made the cake, huh? Yes. Yes. A hundred percent. And it definitely instilled even additional loyalty in me towards LinkedIn and the, the, the culture as well, Catherine. I, I never knew that LinkedIn's culture was what it is. And in hindsight, I totally backed into, obviously I'm biased, but I, I would definitely say is like the best company and company culture that you can ask for. Well, I'm also very biased, but I would 100% agree. <laughs> and I think a lot of employees would too, because everyone, well, I won't say everyone, there are a lot of people who have stayed with the company for many, many years. And so I do think they do a great job of establishing that loyalty. So now, how long have you been at LinkedIn? I think nine months or thereabouts. I started in June of last year. So it's it's right around there. Okay. And you are working remote. You are front end or back end for engineering? Back end, I, I work on the ads reporting team, which falls under the LMS LinkedIn, LinkedIn Marketing Solutions umbrella. Okay. And what language are you working in? Mostly Scala, a little bit of Java as well, neither of which I had any exposure to coming in. So that's been fun as well. Yeah, so that's an interesting key point. There are a lot of times when we are trained either through a boot camp or a computer science degree in certain languages, and then we'll get a job or move to a different project within that job that requires us to program in a different language. So for folks out there who are interested in understanding more about the engineering work that you do, how were you understanding and thinking about this request to do work in this new position where you want to do well in these languages that you didn't have exposure to before? Yeah, a couple of things there. The the first and the biggest and probably most transferable concept that I had was I felt like and I feel like I've learned how to learn. And that doesn't mean that I'm the best at that, but I at least have the confidence that I know what questions to ask, either Google, chat, GPT, or, or pick your platform, how to navigate through and to learn what I need to learn in whatever I'm being asked to do. So I feel like that's critical. And then as a an aside, being the apprentice that I am, a LinkedIn Reach apprentice, we have 20% of our time is able to be dedicated specifically to learning. So that was, a, I guess, an additional buffer in my mind where one day out of the week, I'm al allowed to earmark specifically for learning. So even if I have to to dive in and you know only dedicate that to learning Java or Scala, which I have some weeks, I knew that I had that as well in my back pocket. Yeah, I really appreciate that 20% time, especially coming in as an apprentice. Tell me a little bit more about your team, your relationship with your manager. Did you have a mentor? What was the whole um, feel of this new position and new team like? Yeah, it's absolutely great. I guess I don't have an alternate reference point, at least in the tech world, but I couldn't ask for a, a better manager. And I'm not just saying that in case he's, he's listening. He, he's truly, it's interesting because I don't think I've told him this, but I've told others where I was an assistant manager when I left my previous job. And I never thought that I was a good manager, but I thought I was good with people. But it's so interesting now, Catherine, because even though I'm not a manager, I, I fully recognize that I'm a reach apprentice. Part of me still, it's almost like a, what if I was a manager, how would I approach different things? And I've learned so much in observing how he handles himself and handles the team and handles tough situations where uh, I, I am learning all kinds of things, just, I guess, through osmosis with him. So in terms of managers, couldn't ask for a better one. I was paired with a mentor, same thing there, couldn't ask for a better one. I feel completely supported in that capacity. And even though I'm fully remote with the team, I feel like, and this is probably aided by the fact that I was able to go over and meet most of the team in California at the end of August, I think it was. We had our last team outing before the uh, macroeconomic headwinds kind of put a damper on future travel plans, but I was able to meet them and that definitely helped you know, facilitate the remote interactions on Slack and Teams that we have now. But I definitely feel like I can reach out to any of them at any given time and get the support that I need. What's one thing that your manager has done 
well or that you respect? Yeah, I'll, I have a quick answer just because I've had to answer this before. He's very good at time boxing, which that's one thing in the past that even though I feel like I've been blessed with good managers in the past, they had the tendency to just kind of let anything happen during meetings. But my current manager is very good at time boxing and setting aside dedicated time to try to get through different topics. And even if they aren't concluded, there's usually a plan to, you know, to continue that conversation offline or in a different capacity. So that was definitely one of the, the big things that I learned. I want to branch out of that because you are new-ish or within the first year at the company, you are new to these different languages, um, and you have also started your own podcast. How do you manage your time? Yeah, great question. I do the best. Well, I guess let me start by maybe explaining the why behind it and then jump into the time management if you'll entertain that. So yeah. the, the why behind that, Catherine, is again, I, I don't know if it was guilt or what it was, but I was, I was reflecting after working at LinkedIn for not that long and realized how fortunate I was to have made the transition that I did. And I was trying to think of why it took me so long to, to find my passion and to actually move into what I wanted to do. And my answer to that was there was no blueprint for me to follow. I didn't know anybody that was a software engineer. I didn't have an example that I could pattern match. And I was trying to figure out how I might help facilitate that for others that may be like me in the journey before. And I guess what the format I landed on was a crowdsourced version of successful career transitions, which is what the the podcast has kind of turned into. So that's the why behind it. And then in terms of time management, I guess this goes back to trying to learn how to learn new things. I had landed on the podcast format. And so I was like, okay, what's the, like the minimum viable product? What do I need to produce a podcast that I'm confident and proud of, I guess. And I was able to figure out the the tools that I needed and to, to top it off, everything seemed to be free, which was absolutely amazing. So I figured out the framework through which I might be able to provide it. And in terms of the time obligation I'd landed on, it was a little bit arbitrary, but I knew I wanted to be consistent. So I was going to come out with an episode a week and somehow I landed on Tuesdays. Don't ask me why. That's just what I landed on. And so I was like, okay, so at a minimum, we'll target an hour. If it goes over or under, that's okay. The target is an hour. So it's probably going to take an hour to have the conversation. We'll say another hour, maybe two at the most to have it edited, to do all the graphics, everything that goes with it, to upload it and whatnot. And for the most part, that's pretty much held true. Uh, I also post uh, pretty regularly on LinkedIn. So that takes a little bit more time. But I guess to answer your question directly in terms of time management, you know, we all have 24 hours in a day. We're supposed to sleep eight hours of those. And I do the best that I can to abide by that. You know, most of us are working for the other eight, which leaves eight more to do other things. And I think you don't have to be robotic about it, but if you're cognizant of that limitation on your time, I feel like it's easier to be intentional with the decisions that you make during that time. Because it's so easy with so many choices that we have to, to watch Netflix and to do various other things. There's always things that want to occupy our time. And if you're enjoying your life and everything's working for you, that's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But for me, I wanted to figure out how to start producing content instead of just consuming it. So I guess recognizing the available time, I was able to carve out a slice of that and to try to dedicate that towards the podcast and also towards producing content on LinkedIn, which so far has been fairly successful, at least in terms of the cadence at which I was able to, to put things out. The podcast is called Exponential Growth, How to Break into Tech, and I believe it's available on most platforms. James, it's been super successful and you have been pumping out episodes that have helped hundreds, if not thousands of people. You have thousands of followers on LinkedIn. I see that you post almost on a daily basis. How do you do it? Yeah, no, I appreciate the uh, the kind words. And in terms of the how, you know, I guess speaking more to the the LinkedIn posting, I uh, 
I definitely now leverage the scheduled posts, which if anyone's unfamiliar with that, LinkedIn gives you the option to basically plan out your next, I guess, entire year if you wanted worth of posts. And I definitely do that. And in terms of the the how, sometimes it's six in the morning when I'm on the couch and feel inspired to write. I, I try to jot down bullet point notes in Notion. That's my, I guess, editor of choice. And I guess whenever I'm feeling creative, Catherine, I'll just return to that and I'll try to, again, I guess going back to my manager's idea of time boxing, try to just iterate off of those bullet points that I've made and try to create posts. And once they're in a a form that I'm happy enough to release, I'll go ahead and schedule those on LinkedIn. And it, that sounds like a great process and it is. And if I told you that I'd perfectly followed that ever since I started posting, it would be a lie. It's not always that robotic. I definitely have mornings where I have no idea what to post and I just throw something up. And yeah, so I that's a, a long answer to your question, but trying to have a system and being okay when things don't go according to plan, I think are important for kind of setting realistic expectations with that. I find that what I'm working with different friends or colleagues or people who are coming to me for advice around social media and posting, there's a lot of thought that everything needs to be new and exciting and fresh. And yet what I found and what I've seen in your content is that it's repackaging a lot of the same things. That doesn't mean it doesn't have impact or value. It absolutely does. But you continue to talk about the same kind of topics because it's on brand. How do you either not feel redundant with the content you're posting or how do you generate something that's just slightly off something else you did so it feels new enough but you're not having to reinvent the wheel yeah i guess i definitely have core topics like i have a a google sheet of topics like imposter syndrome traditional education boot camps you know different things that people in my situation and people that i'm trying to speak to would probably go through And to answer your question directly, I guess if I ever get to the point where I feel like I'm just rehashing something I've done before, I usually scrap that. Not always. Sometimes things that really resonate. And let's say that I posted it four or five months ago. And if the follower base is 10x what it was five months ago, you know, other people probably need to hear that. So I guess I've I usually, by default, I don't feel like I'm repeating myself, even though to your point, I'm I'm very much, if you want to call it, on brand, talking about similar things. I I guess I feel like I'm approaching them from a different enough lens where it doesn't feel that way to me. And you have had your following grow by a huge amount. And the topic you're talking about is so relevant, not only to the platform you're posting on LinkedIn, which is all about careers and often about tech. But I'm curious if your following has grown because of the relevancy of your topic or because of your strategy and your voice, the stories that you're telling and the way that you tell them. Yeah, I guess I don't know the answer to that, Catherine. I'd love to say that it's the latter. It's just my voice and what I'm saying. But yeah, I I, I don't know (laughs) what it is. I'm definitely... You know, definitely not complaining. And if anything, you know, I try not to look at the numbers, the followers, the metrics and whatnot. I'd be lying if I said that I stuck to that. It's impossible not to watch that. And I feel like being aware of those is a signal that something's working in some capacity or not. So, yeah, I don't have a great answer for you as to what it is, but it just feels like it's resonating with people. And I guess the biggest metric for me is the the amounts of direct messages that I get on LinkedIn. I try to answer them all. I'm sorry if I don't, if to anyone out there listening, but just hearing, you know, that a, a post that I wrote really resonated with someone just means the world. So I know as long as I'm getting those, I'm gonna keep doing what I'm doing. Yeah, that makes sense. I love that everyone can hear that even you who I see as someone who has grown this following, you're talking about a topic that helps a lot of people um, that you're not even sure what what is pushing that momentum specifically, because I think that's part of the process. Sometimes it's just about 
speaking to what we're most passionate on. And then if it resonates and people gravitate towards it, great. And if not, then you're still fulfilled with it because it matters to you. Absolutely. No, I agree 100%. Yeah. Well, I encourage everyone to listen into the podcast. I've heard several episodes. And even though I've gone through a very similar journey in terms of breaking into tech, there's so much more to learn. And there are so many different ways to go through that process uh, that you can never you know, hear enough. And really what it speaks to is all of the different opportunities that are out there. There's no one path to success or to fulfillment or to whatever you are called to do in this life. And I love that you're speaking to that, James. And so I'm curious, what does your path look like as you glance into the future? Yeah, great question. And, you know, I've tried to answer this for myself of late, Catherine. And what I think I realize is no matter what I say, I, I feel like that path is going to be different. Because when I look back five years and try to extrapolate forward, I never would have imagined that I'd be working at LinkedIn, you know, working in that that management job at the time. Five years before that, if I was in Sweden or even college before that, I would have never imagined. So I embrace that and I'm looking forward to the fact that I have no idea what's actually going to happen. But in terms of the plan, I'm absolutely enjoying what I'm doing at LinkedIn. I still feel like nine months in that I'm in the honeymoon phase for the most part. So loving what I'm doing every day. I'm loving producing the podcast and the LinkedIn content. I don't know if that branches off in anything to the future. I'm kind of just letting that do its thing right now. And yeah, uh, sorry, I don't have a more glamorous answer for you, but that, that's kind of where I'm at. And that's my, my honest answer. What I love about your answer most is that it's not glamorous. I think a lot of people have the expectation that those who are successful have it all planned out and it leads to some glamorous finale with fireworks and champagne, but that's not actually the way that it tends to work out. We are all in process. We are all trying to understand what's the next move and where is my life going. So I think that you gave, in my opinion, the best answer by saying, you know, it's it's evolving and you're not sure. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. James, as we wrap up, any final comments or tips that you'd like to leave with listeners? I guess just believe in yourself. No matter what you want to do, don't let other people define what success means for you. But I would encourage anybody out there listening to explore interests. It doesn't matter how old you are. A lot, a lot of the guests that I interview on my podcast, you know, they started exploring when they were in their early 20s. It, it took me until my early 30s to really start exploring. So the age doesn't matter. And I truly believe that you are only limited by your imagination. I feel like if you have a goal and you pursue that goal, and you refuse to give up, it's only a matter of time that you accomplish said goal. Yeah. True words were never spoken. Thank you, James. And if everyone would like to connect with you, is LinkedIn the best spot or are you on other channels as well? Yeah, mostly on LinkedIn. Feel free to, to follow or send me a connect message. I'd be uh, happy to connect there. I've also got the the podcast, which you mentioned. And at least at this time, you can find that at howtobreakinto.tech if the website is up. Hopefully it is. So yeah, you can reach out on LinkedIn. I'd be happy to, to chat. Awesome. James, thank you so much for coming on the show. To everyone listening, Go check out James's show, Exponential Growth, How to Break into Tech. This is Katherine Lewis. Please subscribe to Opportunity Made. We are on most podcasting channels, Spotify and Apple. You can listen to us there. And I just want to say it has been a pleasure walking through your journey and sharing the message that there is opportunity all around us. And if you have the courage to just go out on a limb and try something new, you never know what's going to open up and where the world will take you. So with that, serve widely, give greatly, and take care, y'all.